Hello. We don't have theme music, but we are Kitchen Party. Uh, welcome to Kitchen Party. Uh, how do I get rid of this thing? There we go. Yes. Okay. Let me unmute all these lovely people. Um, Woo! Hello, friends. <laughs> welcome to Kitchen Party. Uh, if you have not been here before, it's pretty much what it sounds like. Um, we are essentially in a virtual sense. Imagine that we are all sitting in the kitchen of uh, the very, very gracious and multi-talented Jared, uh, who is in the upper right-hand corner here, uh, although he is in fact in Seattle and the other three of us are in Toronto. Um, and he is going to, this evening, make us a lasagna while we hang out in his kitchen and chat. Um, so uh, we could do a, we could do a quick go around and everyone just say hi and say your name and then uh, Jared, you can explain what you are going to cook for us this evening. So it broke up a little bit on my end there, so I don't know what you just said. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> just say, say hi, introduce yourself. Hello, I am Jared. <laughs> I co-host the <laughs> Tolkien podcast by the Bywater on the Megaphonic Network, um, and I make a lot of food. <laughs> Cool. Yeah, I'm Sharoni. I'm in Toronto. Um, I'm an educator of various sorts and an artist sometimes. And um, I'm sorry that Jared's all the way in Seattle and we can't enjoy the actual food. <laughs> we'll just have to imagine. Yeah, I did say bring your own cheese when I when I posted about this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Byoc. Jim, hello. Hi. Um, my name is Jim. I am. Uh, novelist, uh, filmmaker, and game maker. Um, and I help out with different community um, organizations uh, in the usually in the game art space. Um, yeah, I'm just happy to be here and uh, have a chat. Yay. OK, so I'm going to uh, see if I can enlarge, not me, <laughs> so he can show us what we are doing, what he is doing. Um, uh, <laughs> what were you going to say? <laughs> uh, I was going to say, so explain to us, Jared, what you will be making this evening slash afternoon, depending on time zones, and what it involves, what you have in front of you. I was just making a lasagna. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, the, like, the original premise, I guess, of this stream was always, like, picking something super ambitious. Jared makes and, something fancy. <laughs> yeah, like an opera cake or a goose or whatever. Um, but... It's been kind of a rough week for a lot of people. <laughs> um, and I couldn't think of anything that I just had the mental energy to make. So I'm going with lasagna, which is a comfort food for me, I guess. I had never thought of it that way until mm -hmm. thinking about the stream and going, oh, you know, actually, <laughs> that sounds really good. <laughs> I need lasagna. <laughs> I need cheese. Yes. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to be making more or less my mom's lasagna recipe, mm -hmm. which we are not Italian. And <laughs> I always feel like I have to apologize <laughs> for how this is going to go because <laughs> it's not authentic. No. And that's a whole conversation to have when it comes to food. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not going to have it right this second because I got to start cooking stuff. Um, I looked at a lot of other lasagna recipes just to see like what I'm doing wrong. And a main difference actually seems to be just that I don't use ricotta. I use cottage cheese, mm -hmm. um, which may not actually be that weird. I don't know. But <laughs> it's what my mom always used because the ricotta was expensive when I was growing up. Um, and she figured out how to make her own after a certain point. But just got used to doing it this way. So I'm actually going to start cooking sauce right now. And okay. this is not, I don't, I think a lot of recipes will tell you to use Italian sausage. I just use <laughs> promo. Pull it up, pull um, it up to our... <laughs> just, this is an American uh, sausage. Sometimes. Yeah, just okay. a sage pork sausage because <laughs> the sage is really great in this. And with Italian oh, sausage, it's already um, spiced. So I can't control what I put into it if I use mm -hmm. a pre-made Italian sausage. So I'm going to go over to the stove now. Okay. Are there other ingredients that you have in front of you that we can we can see? Or yes, but I need to get this started because the sauce has to cook for kind of a while. So I'm going to 
whole cake. <laughs> There's going to be um, garlic, onion, red wine. Oh my god. Uh, cheese. Thyme, rosemary. <laughs> there will be cheese. Is it is it mozzarella that you put on top of the lasagna? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. The ricotta just go, the cottage cheese just goes inside. Mm -hmm. Okay. So on that note, uh, I was I was thinking about the idea of having a family recipe that's you have always your family is always made a certain way and you grew up with it and at a certain point you realize this is not how everyone else makes it or it's not the authentic way or it's <laughs> the wrong way that you make it but but you like it and i i i definitely have an example of that um i was well into adulthood before i realized that um the thing that I make, that I learned from my mom, that my mom calls an omelet, and I call an omelet, is not in fact an omelet. No. <laughs> but what it's good, it? and it's easy. It's probably closest to a simplified frittata. Oh. <laughs> like, it's just, you, you, so you, I mean, the way I make it is, and the thing is, I make this, like, maybe once a week. It's my, it's one of my, like, easy, go-to, fast regular weekday foods and it's um break a couple eggs into like a small bowl and just kind of scramble it with some um a little bit of milk and maybe some herbs salt whatever you have around uh and then um whatever vegetables you have chop them up whatever cheese you have chop it up and then you just like take the frying pan you put the eggs in you heat it up you like butter put the eggs in the vegetables on top of that put the cheese on top of that put a lid on it turn the heat down leave it for like five ten minutes boom you have a frittata-like thing. Take it out, fold it over. <laughs> it has all your food groups in it. It's tasty. <laughs> it's not an omelet, which is <laughs> well, that's kind of like... similar to omelets that I have seen. It's just not like like a proper French omelet. That's... Yeah, yeah. It. I don't know. Perhaps there is. Perhaps there is a like an an omelet. A different nationality of omelet that this is because my mother is Dutch, uh, and so that's sort of what's what she's coming out of in terms of a, a cultural cooking background. But um, yeah, it's not, it is, I have not seen it anywhere else. I have not seen anyone make a thing that they called an omelet if there was anything <laughs> like this. Um, but uh, so how about you guys, Jim, do you, are, do you have? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I, I, I remember when I was a kid, um, uh, we would, we were assigned uh, one night a week uh, to cook for the family. My mom uh, raised us on her own and she needed a break every every so often. Um, very reasonable. Um, what wasn't reasonable was that I made the absolute lowest amount of effort uh, when it came to the food. So I would boil uh, hot dogs. That was my <laughs> go-to. Water, hot dogs, <laughs> and uh, as an adult, an adult father, I am, of course, deeply ashamed of this. And my my, <laughs> my, my daughter revisits it on me uh, unknowingly. I don't think I've ever mentioned this to her, but she's, uh, but yeah, she does the absolute minimum. And I'm like, yeah, that's kind of what I deserve. That's what I deserve. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, just but the other I, day. Sorry. Sorry, go on. Oh, I was talking to my mom. Uh, about oh yeah, I boiled a bunch of potatoes and now I have potatoes and you know I took a bunch in the instant pot and then I you know I, I cut them up for uh, fried potatoes or I mash them up for mashed potatoes or cut them up, put them in a salad and she was just it just impressed the beneath <laughs> she couldn't believe it she couldn't believe her her little hot dog uh, boy actually grown up and now had three different uses for boiled potatoes but. <laughs> We had Not to do only. the one night a week thing too. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, but there were six of us, so it was she only cooked like one night a week after a certain point. Nice. What was your? Okay. <laughs> My eyes are. I'm sorry. Oh, this. Um, oh no. See, this is a are... really strong onion. It's this is why you need a towel we're... handy. <laughs> you just have to keep wiping and blotting your eyes. Oh, God. I'm glad it's we're two miles away from the onion. <laughs> it's the memories. It's, it's got really the... emotional over there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm just thinking about home. <laughs> the good old days. I was just oh going to ask you, did you have, <laughs> that's, a, that's a potent onion. You've basically been tear gassed by an onion. I can feel <laughs> yeah. it. I can feel it over here. Oh, my God. <laughs> We're like weeping in sympathy. Okay, maybe I'll let oh, yeah. you go. I'm going to go get a Kleenex. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Felled by an onion. <laughs> oh, my God. 
You never saw him again. <laughs> I had a question for Jim, actually, because um, we were talking about melting cheese before. Mm -hmm. And I just was curious, you were saying before we, we started the call that you're a vegan. And I haven't, I don't think I've ever tried to melt vegan cheese. What are its melting properties like? Well, that that's very funny you should ask, because mm. in preparation for this uh, Mm -hmm. I knew was involving a whole bunch of um, cheese. I decided to put some uh, cheese, vegan cheese, on a tortilla. This is my oh. daughter's uh, favorite um, thing. So we just put oh, yeah. cheese in a tortilla, put it in the toaster oven, and it and this is vegan cheese. So it actually does melt. Can you but can you bring it closer to the the camera? Look at that. There we go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah look looking. Yeah. And it, I, I, it's been almost 30 years for me. So I don't know if it actually tastes like cheese. Like, I don't really have a great memory of mm -hmm. I, mean, I remember it tasted delicious. But that is about it. So, <laughs> I, um, yeah. So this is, uh, I forget the brand. It's a popular band, brand called Daya or Daya? Daya? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Daya. Oh, yeah. yeah. So that's what it is. Um, so, Good stuff. Yeah, there have been like leaps and bounds in the world of vegan cheese. Like it used to be, I remember in the 90s, it was basically a rubbery abomination, but now. <laughs> yeah, it's like, just like tofu or something, but sliced. Isn't mm. that what? <laughs> or processed but, cashews. Yeah. 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 Well, well, but now there's like, they're, they're, I don't know, there, there are more and more like fancy high end experimental vegan cheeses made with cashews, but then actually like, uh, fermented with the right microbiology that produces the good cow's cheese and, and it's I tried some at a, at a friend's birthday party and it was like this is it doesn't taste I mean you, you it would not you wouldn't think it was cow's or, or goat's milk cheese but it's becoming a very tasty thing in its own right <laughs> it's it's um like I think near the beginning I I mean it's it's um it's always been this thing that I haven't really uh, kept up with too avidly. Um, oh, there we go. Mayoko's is a great vegan cheese butter brand. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I, I, I'm not an expert um, I, I'm by any means on this because I kind of was sort of like early on, I'm like, nah, it's not really great. And it was expensive. So I was like, bah. but these days, you know, why not give it a shot? <laughs> so Sharoni, you warned me beforehand not to ask you about food, <laughs> but then you floated okay. a story involving Paris wine and melted cheese that I I, I need to hear expanded. Yeah, Those are no, three I great to, things. I went to Europe a few years ago, and on my first night in Paris, I was staying in an Airbnb in Montmartre, and um, I went down the street, and I, you know, I never really prepare for a trip. I don't have a list of the restaurants I should go to or whatever. So I just went into a little gallery that was open, and I started chatting with the guy in the gallery. And I said, "Is there anywhere to eat around here? I'm not a big fan of big hunks of meat." And um, and he said, "Oh, go to the Refuge des Fondus, which is the fondue place down the street." So I went over there, and I got there a little bit before they opened, and they opened at 7 p.m. And it was a tiny place tiny and what they do is they have two rows of um, tables for two and they are packed together like sardines like there's no space between them so you actually have to climb over the table to get into the wall side seat and so <laughs> they help you with this process so i climbed over the table and i was alone i was dining alone and i climbed over the table and i sat down on the wall side and i was observing as the place filled up super quickly and i got to chatting with the australians to one side of me and the french people to the other and then they bring out the um the choices are a um, veggie version of fondue or a meat version of fondue. So I chose the veggie version and they bring out an aperitif, like a little something. I'm not a big drinker to start with. So I drank the, whatever it was they gave me cure or whatever. I don't know. And um, and then they bring out a large baby bottle full of white wine. And so, <laughs> so, so I just start suckling on the baby bottle. <laughs> I'm not really thinking about how much I'm taking in. Oh, wait, when you said baby bottle, I think I thought you meant like, but you mean a literal baby bottle with like. Oh, I mean a, a literal baby bottle with a plastic or whatever rubber nipple on the end of it. <laughs> and I mean, now under COVID, you're thinking like, oh, this is the least sterile way to have a drink, right? 
<laughs> back then it was just like, take this his experience thing. and make yeah. it less sterile. Yeah. The, um, Somebody the just door, feeds it to you hand. with their hand. <laughs> 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 so I got so tipsy and I was just sitting there thinking like there is no way I'm going to be able to climb back over this table and get out of here <laughs> how am I going to get out of here so I started chatting with the people next to me and then like stayed long enough that eventually I was a little bit more stable but I didn't realize how much how much I was drinking and how low my tolerance actually is <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and what I knew it's hard to pace like, yourself when you're drinking from a baby bottle <laughs> yeah yeah it's, only, it's, it's more than a glass of wine that's for yeah, sure yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I didn't really think about it. And um, and then I noticed on the way out that the door handle is also in the shape of a baby bottle. Mm -hmm. So they have a cute little gimmick in their, in their restaurant. So it was fun. That is, that is well, quite the... It wasn't just you. Like, they weren't just saying, I bet if we give it to her in a baby bottle, she'll drink it. No. No, thankfully not. There sure. was a theme here. <laughs> Yeah, the fondue was oh, amazing God. though. Talk about was, gonna... <laughs> was it served in a diaper? No, no. no. <laughs> we should write to them and suggest it though. It's like that horrible baby shower game where you melt a candy bar and you have to you have put to in show a diaper and identify it. <laughs> Oh my God! So here in Toronto, there were the, uh, the the Torontoites may be familiar, the Torontonians may be familiar with this, but um, there is slash was a popular cafe called the Poop Cafe up on Bloor Street, which was a poo and toilet themed cafe uh, where you went and you sat on the toilet and they brought you like poo shaped ice cream desserts and little tiny toilet shaped dishes, uh, and it was actually like quite popular for a while. For like children's parties and daughter. things. Sorry. Oh, you, you did. So you went. <laughs> yeah, Amelia was was desperate to go. Uh, and, and she's been a few times. Uh, yep. So it, it it was right the sweet spot of like I think she was nine or something when it was right. It, Hilarious. You know, debuted. So she was like, ah, this is the best poop emoji. Ah. <laughs> Sorry, there's a sweet spot for the poop cafe because I went as an adult with an adult friend. <laughs> It's just down the street from me. That's true. That's true. So how was how was the food at the poop cafe? I actually only had a hot chocolate and it came in a mug the shape of a toilet. Um it was fun. They have mm -hmm. fun poop facts all over the wall and um, you know, like how much poop people produce and I don't know. And and if you measured out poop, how long it would be. <laughs> Japanese thing, right? Yeah. There's a there's a museum in Japan that's that's dedicated to this. There is a poop museum. So. Yeah, that sounds familiar. <laughs> yes, I think so. Anyway, my my favorite quote of the story is that uh, when the pandemic started and restaurants had to shut down, um, they started they they started a pop up mask making uh, shop right in the. Oh, we have a comment on the food cafe. <laughs> food is good, but the decor <laughs> maybe. Oh. Please. They said it. I was walking past it to meet a friend in a park at one point when it was still possible to like hang out outside wearing masks, but you know, not inside. And I saw that they had um, set up like this little sewing shop in the poop cafe because people couldn't go in because it's a cafe. Um, but they were they were sewing and selling masks. And I got to the park and I met my friend and I said, did you see that? The poop cafe has pivoted to a mask making pop up shop. And then I was like, this entire sentence would have been incomprehensible to me, like even five years ago. <laughs> like, what is this timeline? <laughs> I, I, is yeah. this timeline? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Jared, I know you've stopped crying, but your sister I told you to stop crying. So just so you know that. <laughs> Thanks, Krista. Have you have you recovered from the onion? I have. <laughs> the onion of doom. More that or was less. that. I feel like that 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 bodes well for the flavor of the onion. If it was powerful enough yeah. to like knock a grown man down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it did dissipate pretty quickly though, which is weird. Normally, it hangs around. <laughs> <sighs> okay, so uh, Jim Shroni, who wants to go first? I want to start. Uh, asking you about your creative projects and stuff that you've done. Me first, I'm pretty sure. sure. <laughs> okay. <Thank you. laughs> 
Sharoni, hello. Um, you can't ask two Torontonians that kind of question when we're both so deferential, though. <laughs> it's right. <laughs> <laughs> so hello. Um, do you wanna? You, I, I allowed you to like introduce yourself briefly, but do you wanna go into a little bit more detail about what your creative practice is? Uh, I know that you were you were working in ceramics, and now you you're but the, the, you, you've been I've doing work in, in different media. So yeah, so I was um I was doing ceramics and teaching pottery adult pottery classes at a studio in Toronto. Um, until the pandemic started, literally like three days before we were all shut down in March last year. And so I've had to pivot a lot this year because um, even on the days where the studio was potentially open, I didn't feel particularly comfortable going into a shared studio space. So mm -hmm. I haven't been into the studio in a year. I haven't been working in clay. I've been playing around with polymer clay at home. I've made a pile of tongues, if anybody has any thoughts. Oh my God, oh my God. Can you show us the tongues? I want to show us the tongues. Show us the tongues. I saw a photo of the tongues, and I want you to show uh, us the tongues. Yeah, just a second. I'll grab a pile of tongues. And while I'm grabbing a pile of tongues, if you can see in my background, I'm also storing up egg cartons and yogurt containers and basically every recyclable option that uh, since last March, I've been just cleaning and, re and recycling things. And I've got um, piles and piles of eggshells that I'm mm -hmm. also starting to just paint and explore, like how to glue them together in interesting mm -hmm. ways. I'm starting to play with it. I've been sitting with these eggshells before I get the tongues, I'll tell you. I've been sitting with these eggshells for so long that it has occurred to me that um, thematically and artistically, they could be some, there could be some interesting projects with them. Like um, I don't have children, I'm in my forties. And I've been thinking a lot about uh, that period of the last few years where I've kind of realized that that's not gonna happen for me. Mm -hmm. And I'm, um, you know, I've had to make peace with that because I don't know if it was a conscious decision on my part, uh, time just passed and, um, and then I've been thinking a lot about what it would be like to make nests for people who don't have or can't have children. Um, so I've been sitting with these broken eggshells, kind of contemplating that and thinking about what kind of materials I'd want to do that in and what kind of stories I'd want to collect from people to inform the um, the sculptural work. And uh, yeah, and so, and the other piece that I've been doing is I had done some watercolor painting and some pen drawings, which I think um, I shared with you, Nadia, that if you yeah, want to share. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to get into those, but first I want to see the tongues. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you just didn't do the picture of a pile of time. You could, yeah. I mean, yeah. whatever's easiest. But you have them there, I figure. Yeah. <laughs> Sharoni has gone to get her tongues. <laughs> I'm going to start adding stuff to the sauce now. I was going to say, what's what's happening over here? Actually, can, maybe, Jared, I'm I would move my computer over, but like, okay, there's no yeah. place to put it. Fair um, I'm what just are you throwing adding? in red wine. Um... A little balsamic vinegar, not a mm -hmm. ton. And then chili flakes, thyme, mm -hmm. basil, mm -hmm. a bay leaf. So what do you use as the tomato base? Is it like uh, crushed tomatoes or do you puree tomatoes that are in a can? Or what um, I just use canned tomato sauce, but like yeah. unseasoned, unflavored. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, which I'll be dumping in in a second, but... I'm gonna get all this in first. You're ready, I'm gonna oh, return to you. Oh, and I will be adding some vanilla at some point too. Some what? Vanilla. What? Okay, that's a secret yeah. ingredient. Yeah, Dang. so I, somebody, so I had a viral tweet about vanilla once and <laughs> <laughs> a friend of mine or said that she always added vanilla to tomato sauce. And I was like, that sounds that sounds weird, this but I'll hurt. try it. Why not? <laughs> um, and then I tried it, and it was really, really good. Wow. Because <laughs> it um, kind of smooths off the, the rough edges. Where the hell was my rosemary? Um, there it is. It takes out, out some of the acid and mm -hmm. adds more of a floral, you know, kind of a vanilla taste, but without getting sweet. Mm -hmm. So it just, it mellows everything out really, really nicely. Huh. That is something so, I would never have thought of. But would like That's to my, if you take nothing else away from that, <laughs> <laughs> just try it once. In the lasagna or what stage are you at? I missed that when I was in getting the, in the, He's I'm putting the a sauce. tiny bit of, of vanilla in the tomato sauce. And apparently it's like, it's a secret ingredient that kicks it up a notch. Oh. Huh. 
So I was, that reminds me of another, another food thing I thought of when I was prepping for this is, um, and this is like way more, this is about as lowbrow as you can go. But <laughs> in, in like, in 1990, uh, a woman I worked at a bookstore with told me that every time her boyfriend made craft dinner, boxed macaroni, uh, mac and cheese for, for the Americans, um, uh, he would add a teaspoon of curry powder to the cheese powder before he made it. And I tried it, and that is, I have made uh, box mac and cheese that way ever since. <laughs> it is hmm. really good. <laughs> Just like That's plain, like good. yellow curry powder? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 box mac and cheese. You don't need to get fancy. <laughs> it's like, yeah, well, no, but... Whatever your plainest ass, yeah, curry powder is that you have in your cupboard. Just mm. knock some in there, and yeah, it's actually very good. So, Sharoni, yes, please. All I want right now is box mac and cheese, now that you've said that. <laughs> so many tongues. Um, I've just got, like, piles and piles of these Fimo tongues that I have been playing with. They're all variations on sort of burgundy. I don't know how well the color's coming through, but they're dark. And um, so just kimchi and box mac and cheese. That is a brilliant idea. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> so how so many of you playing around ones? with these different kinds of uh, formations that we make with our tongues, curling them in different ways, <laughs> waving, like, like letting them undulate and whatever. Mm -hmm. So, and then they all have holes in them. So I could hang them. Somebody suggested that I just hang them around the neighborhood and I could make like a girl <laughs> <laughs> art project. Um, and, it's not and sinister at all. That. <laughs> Sorry? That's not sinister at all. No. <laughs> just some tongues hanging yeah, in a like, tree. Yeah, I don't know what it would be exactly. I haven't figured out what its potential meaning is yet. But anyway, there are. Just... In Toronto, most people would just immediately go, oh, art. <laughs> if you don't... Yeah. In Toronto, if you see something like that, you have no explanation. You're like, must be an art. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think people would get that it's some kind of art project. And if they see them in various places or like little clusters of them or something. But I haven't, I'm, I'm thinking about it, it came out of a project that I was doing for an art uh, program. I, I'm in a fellowship program this year. Uh, mm -hmm. with a Jewish organization in California, in Berkeley. And the idea is to sort of redesign ritual in some way or ritual mm -hmm. objects. And so I was starting to, they, they, initially the process was emergent, right? Like you just start playing with the material mm -hmm. and the impulse toward an idea and then don't worry about planning it particularly, let it evolve. And then mm -hmm. I was supposed to make this pile of tongues into a kinetic sculpture, but I didn't quite figure out how to do that without making it seem like a sex toy. And <laughs> <laughs> which was not what I was going for in this class. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's where I got to. So I stalled on the kinetic piece of it and then um, and then it didn't make a nice noise. Like they, they don't clink together nicely like wood, <laughs> like wood times. They're right, very right. double sounding, right? So they probably would if yeah. you had if they were fired clay like you usually work with, but like a steam yes. is a lot more like rubbery. Yeah. Yeah, it's been, it's also been an interesting process to switch from other, like norm, what I call normal mm. clay, like stoneware clay, porcelain <laughs> clay, to um, this particular product because it's a very different. Um, it, it actually it moves differently. Like what you can do with it feels very different to me at this stage. I'm just going to because Jared is doing something interesting with. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you do that right this second? <laughs> You're clearly... like a cheese goblin. Leave me alone. <laughs> 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 I, I'm making the cheese <laughs> layer. You just check yeah. to see if it's still good, right? You yeah. have to taste test it. It's true. Yeah. What if, so what this, if it was off in some way? <laughs> this is cottage cheese, obviously. <laughs> Leave me alone. Um, I actually, I have had lasagna with ricotta, obviously, like in a restaurant or whatever. Um, and I actually prefer it with cottage cheese because there's a little more of a chew to it. There's a little more texture than just if it was all soft. So, right. I don't know. So, I'm microplaning uh, like a professional some Parmesan. Okay. Well, and then Parmesan I'll put. Just makes everything better. Oh, yeah. There's like <laughs> three or four different cheeses in here. Um, mm -hmm. I will crack an egg into it and add salt, pepper, and then some of the same herbs that went into the sauce. Mm -hmm. Like probably just thyme and basil, maybe some rosemary. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'm just gonna sit here grating for a little bit. I just wanted to check in on the, just wanted to embarrass you with the cheese for a moment. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, Sharoni. Amazing. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, I mean, I got as far as thinking about a Ferris wheel of tongues and then I looked mm. it up oh my online. God. And it, 
<laughs> it generated results that I hadn't anticipated for some reason. I don't know why, <laughs> why I didn't think ahead. <laughs> So, so yeah, so I stalled on that. So now I have a pile of tongues and it was like, they were sort of thematically working through aspects of how we speak to each other, what we say to each mm -hmm. other, like with, you know, with, with what kind of care or in consideration we speak to each other. So I was playing around with that initially, but um, haven't quite figured out what I'm doing with them yet. So I'll probably just keep making some tongues and painting eggshells and then eventually save their <laughs> <laughs> a I, just of love, I love the tongue thing because it immediately like there's so much happening there right away like there's the idea there's tongues as like language and expression and there's obviously the sex thing which is the first thing the internet is going to think of if you google it <laughs> you know? and but you know and there's also sort of a body horror thing of the tongue being you know removed like wandering around outside of a body is kind of disturbing you know when you make the the tongue that realistic because your tongues are very realistic they're like they look like actual human tongues yeah <laughs> maybe a bit larger yes are they really, most of them are larger um and uh and flatter but yeah you the the dissociated tongues the cut off yeah. tongues reminded yeah. me of um titus andronicus and i was mm. thinking of um lavinia is it the one whose tongues are cut yeah. out, whose tongue is cut out of her mouth yeah so i mean like another another mythology that picks up that theme right so an entire carnival of tongues. I love that. Carnival of tongues. I love okay, it. I'll just keep <laughs> making tongues. <laughs> Honestly, I have room for one more bin before I can't walk around my apartment anymore. <laughs> <laughs> really, why let that space go to waste? <laughs> exactly. Oh a my bin gosh. Full of tongues. A, bucket, a bucket full of tongues. <laughs> So yeah, let's talk about your your show that you had. You had an online virtual show. Mm -hmm. um, and sorry, I'm also just checking the comments to make sure I'm not missing anything. But uh, tell us like uh, what the show was and, and where it was and how it worked to have an online show during a pandemic. <laughs> Yeah, it was wonderful. Um, I used to work at the Miles Nadel JCC, uh, which is sorry, the Jewish Community Center at Bloor and Spadina here in Toronto. And um, uh, sorry, this signal is that it's half a block away from me. And, <laughs> and, um, it's, I do that uh, all the time too. It's like, it's right over there. And then I'm like, why would you know what that means? <laughs> and also, what does geography mean anymore? Who knows? <laughs> I, I never leave my apartment, folks. Um, <laughs> So um, I, uh, I I used to work there in a planning role, program development, program planning, and um, left that job to go back to school to study ceramics and to develop more art practices and more educational opportunities for myself in in art and other spaces. Um, mm -hmm. And then this year they were looking for an artist for Jewish Disability Awareness and Inclusion Month. And I proposed a, a series of works on paper that I was thinking about, which are really, they were intended to be concept drawings for ceramic work I hope to make when I can get back into a studio. But for now, they're, I'm, I'm very pleased with them as works on paper, um, as sketches, as, as a little more developed than sketches toward my ideas. And the theme was what I call, I called this show, My Body's Keeper. And they were really kind and they put it up on their virtual gallery on their website during the pandemic in the month of February. And we had a really lovely Zoom launch and a lot of people came to hear me talk about it and engage with it. Um, and I'm trying to develop other ways to get it out in the world. So, um, so yeah, the idea was my body's keeper to think about the relationship between the the ritual, the visual vocabularies of the ritual objects that I was accustomed to growing up with in Jewish synagogue spaces and communal prayer spaces in the Jewish mm -hmm. world, um, which seemed to me to find a very interesting visual mirror in a lot of ritual objects that I use for pain management because I have fibromyalgia. So um, let's call them my crip rituals, as mm -hmm. disability community likes to call everything now, right? Crip this and like crip time mm -hmm. ritual, right? Um, so. It, uh, I think if you have some of the pictures, you'll see, I'll, I'll talk, th I'll talk through them if yeah, you want. I wanted to, yeah. So yeah. I, I, um, I knew you were doing this and then I, I saw your, your virtual ex exhibition and you gave like a virtual talk on it. And I was like, wow, I was, I was just blown away because they're really beautiful, I think, illustrations as well as just being conceptually really interesting. So I don't know that I have them in any particular order here, but, uh, what's this one? This Surprise. Is, oh yeah. Tell us, okay. tell us what this is. Um, yeah, so in synagogue spaces, there's always a, 
a lamp at the top of the ark where the Torah scrolls are kept. So there's an ark at the front end behind the podium where the rabbi stands or the cantor stands um, and leads the service from. And then above that, there is an eternal flame, a ner tamid, it's called in Hebrew. So eternal flame, it's a lamp that is always on and that signifies God's presence in this space. And so I was playing around with this idea of the sad lamp that I live with. And mm -hmm. um, it gets me through a lot of the winter. And I was thinking about what would it look like if we had an eternal lamp that had all of these sad lamp kinds of um, technologies like built around it. So like a whole bunch of mini sad lamp windows all the way around it. And mm -hmm. my thought was that there's uh, the sad lamp is supposed to um, enable Oh gosh, I've already forgotten the science behind it. I was learning it a few months ago for this piece, but <laughs> now, I'm, now I'm blanking. Is it that they're supposed to enable or interrupt the, the flow of serotonin uptake? Oh gosh, oh, that's a good question. <laughs> Apologies for the people listening out there who, who know science, I'm having a blank moment. Um, anyway, it's supposed to stimulate something serotonin related and there's like serotonin receptors when they're diagrammed by medical illustrators often look like the top and bottom of this lamp, like in oh, shape. Oh, wow, yeah, yeah. So I was hmm. playing around with that and, um, and some of the diagrammatic pieces in the background um, have like you'll see like a molecular structure of um, the chemical for serotonin and little like hovering in the background in a couple of places and some <laughs> illustrations like sort of taken from medical illustrations of serotonin um, transmitters. Mm -hmm. So the idea to play with like how how can we how can we combine these two kinds of uh, visual vocabularies, like the things mm. that I'm living with for my own healing and, and spiritual sustenance and bodily health, right? Along with like these things that are supposed to be com communally spiritually sustaining and how, mm. what is the relationship between these two sets of images? And for one thing, like on a personal level for me, I think I derive a lot of comfort from thinking about that relationship. Mm -hmm. I was mm. using the vocabulary of, um, that these objects then like these ritual objects that I live with all the way around me become implicit Jewish ritual objects insofar as I'm reframing them in the context of my my Jewish experience my Jewish life mm -hmm. um but they're not Jewish like they're not ex explicit Jewish ritual objects these these things like sad lamps or uh foam roller like massage mm -hmm. rollers and stuff mm -hmm. like that right mm -hmm. so um the next stage of my project I think I would like to develop this further and kind of push back in the other direction, which is to say, instead of pulling the communal objects and that imagery into my private sphere um, and taking comfort from it on a personal level, like push back against the community and say like, what does it mean if we put this kind of object in the communal space right. and consciously think about where are we, how can we center anti-ableist uh, ritual practices, liturgical changes, um, sermonizing, whatever it is, like just to be, be more conscious about what kind of Torah we're engaging with, what kind of teaching we're offering in the community mm. and how cognizant it is of chronic health issues. And chronic health in particular, because um, I think Judaism has some rituals for acute illness and mm -hmm. some liturgy for acute illness. Um, right, you were talking about this in your, in your talk. Um, Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I was like, that, that was something that really stood out to me, that uh, you had an observation about the difference between uh, responding to acute illness and, and responding to chronic illness. So go on, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's that's the gist of it, I think, that like I think a lot of the time there's um, a really binary approach to illness that you're, you know, you people either have an ill body or a healthy body. Um, that is patently not true for most of us, right? And certainly not across the whole span of our lives. So what do you do for the people who are living with um, chronic and like long-term conditions that flare up from time to time? For some people, they require intermittent hospitalization. Um, you know, it's like a lot of uh, how do you bring that consciousness of the ebbs and flows of energy into communal spaces, into sacred spaces and think and kind of combat compassion fatigue, I think, because mm. I think a lot of the time communal spaces and structures are set up for supporting people in an emergent situation, but not necessarily cognizant of what the long term ups and downs might be for people in their lives. And, you know, I like I've been living with chronic illness for 25 years in my own life and some days are really good. Today seems to be a good day, and some days are quite low. And uh, you know, some some months it ebbs and flows like that. So, how do you how do you create a 
how do you create communal structures? Like I'm looking at that in the sense in the sense of Jewish spaces, but how do you create communal structures and support systems all told, right? Mm -hmm. it's and this is going to be an even more acute question. I'll just add Nadia, sorry, okay. that it's going to be an even more acute question for us coming out of COVID because we're looking at a lot yes. of people with a lot of long haul yeah. uh, chronic stuff yeah. that we don't know anything about mm -hmm. yet, neurological issues and muscle fatigue and you know all kinds of things that are compounded. Sadly, so <laughs> we were laughing before. Let's go back to that. <laughs> there was just, there's just so much going on there. There, once again, it's like you have you you put out an image and it it just goes and it explodes in so many different directions. It's fascinating to me. I want to. I, I do have a couple more that I wanted to show just because I think they're they're gorgeous, like this one. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, that one was a fun one to do. So this is um, against the backdrop of muscle tissue that I turned green. Normally, it's it's it didn't like. Oh, is that what that is? Yeah, <laughs> it's supposed to be muscle tissue, and um, and against that backdrop, I drew a series of Torah cases. And um, I don't know if any of you have any familiarity with what a Torah scroll looks like, but it's a parchment scroll rolled onto two spindles, and then in uh, in synagogues that descend from Eastern European traditions, from Ashkenazi Jewish traditions, um, often you'll find that, they're, that the Torah scrolls are clothed in some kind of fabric dress, right, huh. a Torah cover. But in a lot of um, Yemenite, Syrian, um, Spanish, Portuguese communities, you'll find more often that they're kind of encased. Each one gets its own box, a really beautiful metal mm -hmm. or wooden case. And I was really struck by the beauty of these cases and the shapes of them and some of the decorative elements of them. And I was thinking about what it would be like to turn one of them into a medicine cabinet and to think about what would it mean to put, like to think about the Torah as a healing document in and of itself, which it is not consistently. I think there are some elements in the teaching that have some healing spiritual power for people, but um, what would it mean to really bring that, that consciousness of people's real embodied experiences to mm. our like to make our readings of the Torah a bit more sensitive in the contemporary world. So playing with that idea and thinking about how how beautiful those boxes are and how much I would also appreciate just having like a really gorgeous medicine cabinet that <laughs> all of the things that I have to like all my medical paraphernalia, right? Mm. So yeah, there's often and this is something that uh, I've seen come up in uh, the context of um uh, uh design for like the design that reduces barriers is that there's this sort of mindset that it has to be ugly <laughs> and the idea that you know like the, that the handicapped space has to be kind of like ugly and clunky and, and oddly proportioned and uh why can't why can't it be beautiful why can't that you know why can't we design it to incorporate those qualities that it needs to have and in in a just as beautiful way as you would as you would design anything else like why does it have to look like a medical intervention you know <laughs> or for that yeah. matter why do medical interventions have to look like that like <laughs> That's a great question. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good it's a good design question in general. I mean, I know mm -hmm. especially if it's something that you're interacting with every day and from which you're hoping to draw some kind of spiritual or like moral sustenance, right? That um some kind of like some kind of energy and empowerment, it's nice if it looks nice. And if it feels cool to touch, like, I, I mean, when I like normally when I work in ceramics, I love carving. Um, I love doing like like really decorative carving on work. Um, mm -hmm. And so and part of that is like, and then I leave it unglazed on the outside because I just love handling it afterwards mm -hmm. and the texture of how it feels when it's just uh, like, just got a really nice sort of naked finish to it. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, I think for me, there's a tactile element also. It's nice to handle like smooth Ikea designed things or whatever, you know, whoever makes medical stuff, I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not Ikea, but <laughs> somebody else. But, um, you know, like it's nice to handle like smooth things. It's obviously easy to clean that way or whatever. But, you know, there are certain kinds of objects in my life that I think would be um, nice and also kind of masking. Like when people come over and they, you know, they're like, everybody peeks into your medicine cabinet, right? Like, I mean, yes. <laughs> <laughs> like what would it be like if you had like a sort of, a really cool medicine cabinet like in your living room that you know that held like I have foam rollers I have um hot water bottles I have I don't know like this I have this back buddy thing but you just have this I oh my god yeah oh yeah you did I, I saw the the illustration the the art piece that you did about that and <laughs> yes. 
this is not a sex is, toy, to be clear. Here it is um, real life, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this is so great. If you don't have it, it's so great for um, headache relief too. So you just like yank it over your shoulder like this and kind of um, pull it forward and wow. you can, it's trigger point release, right? So if you yeah. know where, where your trigger points are, uh, in your muscle system, then you can really relieve a lot of pain this way, which is great because I, I live alone. I don't have another person here to just give me a massage whenever I need it. And um, as, a, as a person who chose to leave a salaried job and go into the arts for a while, um, I also don't have a ton of uh, coverage for paramedical supports, you know, outside of OHIP. So, so <laughs> this kind of thing has proven invaluable. <laughs> oh my goodness. One time purchase, forty dollars or whatever it was. <laughs> I am. That is, you know, I've been getting like the the sore back. <laughs> it's 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 actually looking kind of kind of valuable to me as well. Yeah, you know, certainly forty purchase, forty dollars is a lot less than a MSR. You know, yeah. <laughs> uh, Jared, Jim, I'm gonna like either of you guys want to have questions about this. Want to jump in? Oh. Jared, what are you doing? I'm just adding the <laughs> vanilla. Oh, oh, you are? Okay. Yeah, I'm going to pull it off the stove in a little bit so I can start assembling. <laughs> um, but I don't add it right at the beginning so it doesn't all go away. <laughs> but I don't want to add it. Ah, hot sauce. Um, I don't want to add it right at the end and have it just taste like vanilla. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see what you mean. It has to meld. <laughs> yeah. I'm curious. I learn a lot about cooking as we go. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious to ask Roni about... Um, the compassion fatigue. Um, and uh, I, I've just recently in the last few months been um, sort of uh, dealing with a frozen shoulder, um, which has been uh, kind of unprecedented in my life in terms of like um, an ongoing kind of um, uh, pain and um, discomfort. Like I'll wake up in the morning with kind of uh, pain um, and it gets better throughout the day, but you know, it's, it's, um, and it's supposedly something that lasts anywhere between eight months and a year. So for me, it's a bit of a, a, a new um, new experience. Uh, and and I'm sort of like, obviously there's a there's an element of it that has, uh, I can kind of appreciate the empathy that it gives me a little, like a little bit of insight into people who have had longer term things. Um, but um, I'm also conscious of the fact that as soon as it's gone, I'll probably just, it'll just like be like it never was. Like, so I'm curious if you've had like experiences with people that um, like, if there's if there's a way to kind of combat that, uh, hmm. like while I'm in it right now um, to kind of like, I don't know, there's just some part of my brain and I, and I think it's pretty common human thing to just sort of like um, as much as possible, try to eradicate that um, period of your life in terms of uh, that the, the the negative feelings and and uh, physical the physical pain. Yeah, I mean, in, you're asking me in terms of response or in terms of the good I, days. I guess, I guess in terms of like, I mean, when you've when you've seen you know the f compassion fatigue or like the kind of the 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 the. Um, short-term memory people have around uh, being in pain themselves. Everybody mm -hmm. has pain. Everybody gets sick from time to time, but like it's very easy to uh, to sort of like um, to forget about it once you're out of it and and to lose yeah. that. Impact. It immediately becomes an abstract thing again. Yeah, and, and that's that's that. Yeah, that's what I'm I'm kind of curious if you have any uh, ideas as as to how to hold on to it. I don't. Uh, honestly, I don't have any great ideas. I mean, I know in my own life, I've had days where uh, a new medical intervention has worked really well on my body. Like I started taking a medication a couple of years ago, and I couldn't believe the difference it made literally overnight for my body. And I kind of walked around, you know, every time something like that happens, I have several days where I think, oh, good, I've been cured. And then <laughs> I forget too, like you're describing, like when you're when the pain goes away, you're like, oh, okay, this is what life could be like without it. Great, maybe I could try going skiing this year or something, right? And um, and then not, uh, you know, something happens and it just sort of recalibrates itself, and I'm back to where I was, in or be I'm better than I was. Like currently, I am much better than I was in my 30s, for example. But um, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think the key is 
to build good relationships with people on both ends, like to, as a person with a chronic illness and I mean, in life in general, right? To have good solid friends um, and you know a diversity of friends that you can call on so that when one is busy with their own thing or when one is tired and can't handle your concerns that day, that you have other people that you can call on. Um, and that has been probably the thing that has helped me the most in my life is having a fairly, like casting a, fi a fairly wide social network um, and, uh, you know, trying to be willing to be vulnerable with people and to say like, this is a particularly hard day. I say that and I also recognize that there have been plenty of days where I haven't been willing to reach out or had the energy to reach out or um, the people that I was comfortable reaching out to at a certain moment in my life weren't available and I just didn't want to follow up with anybody else. Like how do you call somebody and say, I'm having a really crap day today mm -hmm. when you haven't talked to them in a while, right? So yeah. it's, it's yeah. really hard. I think, I think systemically, um, you know, I suspect, I, I don't, I don't know because I don't actually um, get support from the like social work system, but I suspect that people who have social workers who check on them every week or whatever, like the regularity of that contact is probably a stabilizing force for a lot of people. It's mm -hmm. something that they can look toward every week. Um, although I'm sure it's also very complicated depending on the relationship with the social worker and with the system. Um, but I imagine that may be helpful systemically. Sure, and you have a question from the from the chat. The the chat. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you so much for asking. I don't currently have a website. Um, I have an Instagram account that I haven't used lately, so I could reactivate that. But um, I'm I'm in the process of trying to build a website in the next mm -hmm. couple of months, probably. But thank you for asking. I'm still I'm still sort of like pondering <laughs> and digesting <laughs> uh, everything that you've that you've shown us um, and yeah sort of wondering wondering how to move on from that but I do want to also ask Jim about what's going on. <laughs> uh, well, I, I have one more very trivial thing to mention. Uh, it came yeah, up in my head with Maroni. Was, uh, I was talking, which was that um, we should all have um, kind of like some kind of spray system that when you open up someone's uh, medicine cabinet, it's spraying <laughs> that, like, stuff you get when you you try to take tags off of like merchandise. I, I <laughs> that. that is <laughs> such a good idea. <laughs> and it's been our party. You're like, the, you know who's done who's checked your cabinet. <laughs> Just checked your cabinet. Or no, no you, it's, it's something that, that looks invisible, but it shows up in UV light. And so you think you've gotten away. And then at the end, the host just like shines a UV light over you. And all the people, <laughs> all the the people who open the cabinet. <laughs> it's the big reveal. <laughs> yeah. There's um, I think was it Jennifer Aniston? One of them said that she, one of the actors that I watch on the late night chat shows or whatever had said one point that she left her Oscar or her Emmy in the bathroom because she knows that everybody likes to just have that moment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember who that was, but yeah, I remember hearing. That. Yeah, it was on the Graham Morton show. I remember her, who, so whoever it was, I think. I don't know if it was Jennifer Aniston or somebody else. Maybe somebody. Your moment alone on the throne with the Emmy. <laughs> Very nice. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I am going to uh, put. Jim in the hot seat now. Da, 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 da. There we go. Hello. Hello, Jim. <laughs> Would you like, uh, I think we, hold on, say something. Okay. Oh, Can okay. Sorry. It, yeah, it was, it, it, you got a little faint for a moment there, but I think you're, I think you're back. Um, yeah. So uh, again, you introduce yourself briefly, but uh, tell us, tell us what you're working on these days. Tell us what's, <laughs> what's exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah, a bunch of a bunch of different things. Um, one uh, is a feature film uh, project that I've been working on for the last few years with um, uh, some friends, Peter Kaplowski, who runs the Midnight Madness um, segment at TIFF, um, and um, uh, and Ashley Wessel, who's a, a, um, a horror uh, film director. Um, and uh, we're, it's basically the project is something I've written um, about. It's like a, a feature film clip about. Um, uh, the, uh, you know, th th there's some kind of um, interdimensional uh, 
uh, disaster and monsters flood down on the earth and everybody's oh, sorry. Uh, devoured. Um, Speaking of devouring, Jared's sure. goes into the cheese again. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Why are you doing that? <laughs> <laughs> because I can. <laughs> Thanks, Nadia. <laughs> I feel like, like a, you know, in movies when like they turn the light on something and there's some horrible thing crashed in the corner, like nibbling on a skull or whatever. That's what I feel like whenever you do that. Is that what happens in your movie, Jim? <laughs> yeah, it's basically the whole movie. You've given it away, but you know. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I feel like that's that's got a lot of legs just on its own. Um, mm -hmm. Just the cheese goblin. Yeah. <laughs> Copyright me. <laughs> He's calling the Jared Pekka check story. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, uh, but that's not all, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so so basically, it's um, scenario is that uh, the rest of the world has been devoured. Um, there's uh, uh, there's a small enclave of survivors on Toronto Island. Um, because it's a little <laughs> bit isolated, yes. um, and basically the the story is set 15 years after the uh, the, the event, um, and uh, the other folks, uh, basically the, the the teenage children of the of the survivor, discover what actually um, has been uh, the the parents have have done to keep them safe. Um, the terrible things. Uh -oh. So um, yeah, it's called Lest We Be Devoured. So it's yeah, it's it's kind of a um lovecrafty and post-apocalypse um nice. yeah and i'm i'm just I'm gonna like, keep talking i'm just like the interesting visual stuff is happening with the food so i'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. putting that on the screen yeah sorry you know and i i have often thought when people say when the the question comes up as it does uh where in toronto would you go in the zombie apocalypse uh what mm -hmm. do you think would be the safest place and i think toronto island like you know it's an island right i mean yeah. it's uh, the zombies, you know, maybe they can swim. Maybe they're the kind of zombies that don't need to breathe, so they'll just, like, walk across the bottom of Toronto Harbor. But still, it's, like, a more effort to get there. It just seems more defensible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and in the case of the um, uh, this particular apocalypse, it's more of a... They're more of a kind of, like, praying mantis sort of style monsters, 10-foot tall okay. bug yeah. monsters. And, uh, and so, so they don't like the yeah. water. Um, but there is uh, every year uh, the possibility once the, the lake freezes over that the that the uh, that the stalkers can get across the uh, yeah. across the lake. So um, there they have various the islanders have various um, sort of systems in pay, place and protocols to kind of keep them safe in that period of time. So um, yeah, so it's. Uh, have you ever <laughs> have you ever read the web comic Stand Still, Stay Silent? I uh, know I have not. Okay. I know this is not like, oh my God, it sounds just like that because really? I hate it when people say that to me about stuff. <laughs> but the they take the notion of like post-apocalypse island sort of nation things in really interesting directions. So hmm. um, I was just reminded of that. Not in the cool. Yeah. I'll check it out. I've been I've been doing as much as I can, kind of like trying to get a sense of the uh, other other. Uh, yeah, other projects in that space, and yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. it's very, it's very different from what you're describing. Just to be clear, yeah. just to cut in here, so Jared, you're using the the non pre cooked noodles. Yeah. are they just like regular noodles, and or are they just they regular, like, yeah. regular lasagna noodles? I'm making a mess. Um, I'm just waiting for you to lick your arm. I'm not going to do that. Um, <laughs> Why? What's did you get food on your arm? Yeah, he splattered a little. I saw, I saw him look at his arm. <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna, I don't do that. That grosses me out for some reason. Okay. Um, yeah, some people say pre-cook the noodles. I don't see the point because there's enough liquid in here that they're gonna cook anyway in the oven. Right. It's probably a little faster that way, but then you have to handle hot, wet lasagna noodles when you're layering. And that just seems like a nightmare to me. So or cold wet lasagna noodles if you let them cool off. Yeah, but then they stick. They're all gross. sticky when they get they cold. Sticky. I don't want to. Yeah. It's just easier this way. Okay. Interesting. I don't have to deal with the horrors. What did you put with the cottage cheese? Um, 
an egg to help bind it and salt, pepper, parmesan, thyme, basil, rosemary. Okay, so that's the, and then there's Diane. other seasoning in the sauce. Hmm. There's other seasoning in the sauce. Yeah, pretty much the same stuff, but with a little more. So. One egg to in the darkness find them. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I wasn't gonna say. <laughs> uh, Jim, we're gonna kind of like while the noodles happen bring Jim back on. Uh, yeah, I, so is this, so what you, you, you've done movies before and one of the really interesting things about them is that you have this uh, collaborative process for, you know, th that they're, they're actually done by, as you know, as a, a group effort by several different people who script them and, and shoot different segments. And is this, is this another one of those or how is your, how is your approach evolved? Yeah, it's, it's not really, it's more of a traditional approach. Mm -hmm. um, my, um, yeah, I started out making movies, I think, 20 years ago. May I, I just um, uh, started, you know, shooting stuff on my buddy's DV camera uh, and, uh, you know, figuring out, oh, I can do this without spending money on, on like, getting film kind of developed and stuff. That's, I, I, I'm in. Uh, I, it always bugged me that I would have to spend a bunch of money to make a movie, like, in the pre-digital pre video, you know? So, yeah. Um, so yeah, once I like figured there's no real like barrier to entry there, and about year 2000 or so, I, I started yeah started making things, and then and then like um, and then I started making a little zine. Uh, it was originally a CD-ROM zine uh, full of like little MOV files of of like shorts that me and other people I knew made, uh, and then we made it a DVD zine once that uh, became more accessible. Um, mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, I started to kind of um, just like discover all these sort of indie filmmakers uh, in the process of like, you know, compiling these zines together uh, who I really liked their work a lot and they like were kind of happy to collaborate. So I started to, um, we did a, a movie in 2007 called Infest Wisely yes. uh, about nanotechnology. <laughs> uh, and um, right. Infest? In the, in Infest Wisely. wisely. Yeah. So, name of it, you know, like, the other one is Game of Thrones. Yeah. <laughs> uh, explain, explain, infest wisely for a minute, because yeah, that's a title that kind of stops people. <laughs> yeah. So, infest wisely um, was about um, a new nanotechnology um, that was delivered through chewing gum um, that allowed <laughs> you to take off like all sorts of, you know, uh, develop all sorts of things, like take pictures with your eyes and and. Um, all the all these different sort of like um, you know science fictional types of enhancements, um, but once they were installed, it was very difficult to uninstall them, um, as some malware and such will will be on your computer. But um, but yeah, so so it was basically it told it was seven different stories um, about the implications of that particular um, new technology. Uh, they each were about anywhere between 10 and 12 minutes long and I got a different director to direct each of them um, mm -hmm. so I wrote the whole thing and then I brought a bunch of folks to each direct one of them and so um, yeah so it was it was um, it was a really uh, good experience we I think we did it for 700 bucks and in six months like we just did it from beginning to end and uh, and it was uh, you know we screened it at the Royal and and it was, you know, it was it was sort of a, a feature length kind of thing. Um, so, I mean, it's pretty terrible. I mean, uh, in terms <laughs> of like uh, any sort of, uh, you know, normal metric of of uh, of uh, quality, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but it was it was also really fun to do and and um, a great way to kind of develop our skills a little bit more. And um, yeah. And then. Like a few years later, um, we uh, I wrote another one. Same, it's, it, uh, I, I called it lo-fi sci-fi. So like, mm -hmm. you know, stuff that was like really, um, uh, you know, you, instead of like very fancy special effects or whatever, you would use dialogue to communicate a world and that kind of stuff. So um, the second one was um, a mockumentary called uh, Ghosts with Shit Jobs. 
I was, I, was, I was wanting you to talk about Ghost and Shit Jobs because I really enjoyed that movie and I have like a couple screenshots from it. But yeah, explain it, set it up, explain the premise. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. So the premise is that it's the year 2036 um, and um, the economy's flipped and uh, basically um, like all the all the shitty jobs uh, in the in the world are are done by the West for China and the East, basically. Um, so the, you know, basically the inverse of of, of what uh, we have now, or what's in in the, in the midst of changing. Colonialism but, is flipped, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Tables so, and the and the mockum it's a sort of mockumentary style, so that um, you know it was kind of like all oh, these poor people born into the slums of Toronto, you know, and <laughs> and they had these really jo like like bad jobs like digital janitor and so yeah, years. this is the this is our friend Sean working as a digital yeah. janitor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Can you yeah. explain what what that job was? <laughs> sure. So so he's basically. Um, you know, walking around uh, a, a, a version of Google Maps that's a, a fully immersive simulation of the world, but he has to uh, blur out anything that's like copywritten. So, but he does it manually. He has to kind of go around and do it all by hand. So, over everything in this virtual yeah. world. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then the uh, other one, this is such a good uh, image the, the baby yeah. maker AI people, robot people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so the idea is that they, um, they've created babies that are so realistic that basically they have, um, uh, you have to raise them for the first three months um, like they were real babies. So the people who are kind of like in, in, in Toronto who are, who are raising the babies to be saleable um, are basically stuck perpetually with, you know, babies between the age of zero and three and then they ship them off in boxes and then they get another batch of like uh newborn infants that they raise to the age of of three months and then ship <laughs> off and, but basically yeah so it's it's um the, the demand for very realistic babies was was is high in in uh, beijing so that's the uh, <laughs> that's the that's the thing so it's it's like a comedy it's a um there's uh uh there's links and stuff like, ghostwithshitjobs.com. Um, basically, Ghost with Shit Jobs is like um, the translation of the of the kind of mockumentary reality show that, and Ghosts is like, uh, is um, Cantonese slang for, for white people. So um, so that's where that name comes from. Um, but yeah, uh, if, you, if you Google Ghost with Shit Jobs, it's basically the only thing that comes up. So it's a good, it's a good <laughs> Google friendly. It has good SRO. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, SEO. Yeah. So, so yeah, so that was like, um, you know, like we spent uh, 4000 on that one. So budget really went up uh, like crazy with that. But when mm. in that time, it was four different parts. So four different directors, um, each doing like, you know, 20, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, I forget what it was, something like that. And, and it combined to form a feature again. So um, yeah, so that that was the kind of um, approach I took for for quite a while, um, and then um, yeah, just recently, um, you know, have been you know getting to know people that I'm really excited about working with, and and um, Ashley's a really talented um, uh, director, and and she's done a bunch of shorts, and she she was a friend, and she'd read the script, and she really responded to the script and the story and such. So I was like, yeah, maybe you wanna maybe we can collaborate on this. So. So, yeah, we're in the process of trying to raise like a one point six million dollar budget for it on um, mm -hmm. telefilm and all the rest of it. Um, mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, and in between, we did a a, a web series called Haphead, um, mm -hmm. uh, which was uh, we got about one hundred and fifty thousand to to shoot um, from uh, from a um, a web series um, funder called the IPF. So. So yeah, so it's it, it, it's another it's title, time. Haphead, that you're going to have to expand on a little bit for those. Yeah, <laughs> sure. so Haphead is um, again an, another science fiction uh, story, sort of like a bit of a bit of a neo noir type of um, uh, concept of like um, you know a couple of um, uh, basically the a near a near future video game setup where. The haptic, um, the feedback that you get from video games is so good; it it feels like you're really there. So, um, so it's it's the missing piece essentially to 
to kind of like learning how to do physical activities um, within, you know, obviously like there's lots of video games that kind of get you doing things and all that kind of thing. But they, the haptic feedback actually gives you enough of a, of a, of a kind of feedback loop to learn things like fighting, if you're playing a fighting game or whatever. And as a result of like all these, um, this new technology, of course, it created a subculture of like teenage ninjas and all the rest of the, the that are sort of running amok all over the place. So this subculture uh, is called the Hapheads, and they basically all have kind of like developed these like extraordinary abilities through through the the, the playing of these games and stuff like that. So um, yeah, so that's uh, that's and that's at haphead.com as well. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I jump in and just ask, yeah, do you want the tongues for anything? <laughs> <laughs> A good thing to have in my head because I mean I know there's a good supply of tongues somewhere. Yeah, you write, write something around that really. Yeah, you could you could make props for this for this. Yeah, I'm feeling like there's a potential collaboration here for sure. Yeah, it sounds awesome. Yeah, I love that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Jim, we had uh, Dave Fernandez on an earlier episode of this. So we, we yeah. got like the, the indie uh, horror sci-fi <laughs> Toronto filmmaking or Ontario filmmaking crew is, is being represented well. And yeah, he was talking about how the, I mean, the, just because the way, the way that the technology and economics of the industry has shifted over the last 20 years has in some ways made it a lot more accessible, but has just really like upended everything. <laughs> Everything that you thought you knew in, you know, the year 2000 is now, is now obsolete. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it's changed. Um, I mean, in my opinion, a lot of it is for the better just because it's lowered the, like, the, the barriers for people mm -hmm. playing around in, the, in that field. Um, so, yeah, I think you do get more experimental stuff and, and all the rest of it. But, um, yeah, yeah, I, I, I met, uh, I met Dave through, um, through, like I think he lent me a camera at some stage when we needed a camera, so he was very generous and help, helping helping us out. I think it was for Ghost of Shit Jobs, but uh, or it might have been in Fest Wisely. Even he was he was early early mm -hmm. on. There, so yeah, hmm. yeah, <laughs> it's a good community. I'm gonna because you also work in a lot of other. You've got the the. Um... I want I want you to talk about texture a bit and and uh, and gain because those are the projects I've actually worked a little bit with you on. But I'm also just randomly going to ask you about here we go the graphic novels that you wrote. <laughs> yeah, about, about yeah. A post a po the post rapture graphic novels that you post wrote. Post rapture <laughs> graphic novels, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, they're they're kind of taking the. It's, I like to think of it as a bit of a reboot of the Book of Revelations. Um, <laughs> It's uh, basically my take on uh, the rapture mythology um, as an agnostic um, saying, okay, so say people do float up into the sky, what else follows from that kind of world building, right? So um, yeah, so so uh, in the, the Therefore Repent was set in Chicago. Both of them are set in American cities, which is unusual mm. for my work. I almost always set my stuff in Toronto or Canadian cities, um, but um, the, Rapture is such a peculiarly American um, phenomenon that it just didn't seem to make sense to set it here. Um, so, in the case of uh, of therefore repent, it's it's it follows a couple of folks um, around uh, like uh, uh, Chicago after after the rapture, and in, and in uh, sort of my mouth, it's Detroit. So, both of which are cities that I've enjoyed kind of um, hanging out in and and like kind of. Especially Detroit was a great excuse to go and, and spend some time there and 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 uh, stay with folks and see see the type of art scenes and different kind of communities like uh, oh. coming up there. Sorry, I was trying to do something and I did something else. Uh, I I was just going to yeah the. Um, you worked with you worked with two different illustrators and I have like <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Shannon, Shannon Gerard's illustrations for this are so. I'm just gonna like randomly hold it up and flip through, but I, and I don't know if this is a particularly effective way of <laughs> conveying this information. But I just they're just really expressive. And uh, so, how does uh, can you tell me a little bit about the process of collaborating with an illustrator uh, as a 
as someone doing the writing for a graphic novel? Like, did you just sure. kind of like hand it over to her, or was there was it more of a back and forth? Yeah, I mean, the biggest um, the biggest thing I mention when it comes to that type of collaboration is that um, the artist does ninety percent of the work um, in terms mm -hmm. of that pure hours put into. Uh, creation of that kind of thing. And I think that's a big surprise for most people, especially if you're a writer and you're like, hey, I'd love to make a comic book. Um, <laughs> it's like basically the proposition that you're making to an artist is like, hey, let's make something together, except you do 90% of the work and I'll do 10%, <laughs> but we'll both do equal billing. Maybe I'll even have my name first. Um, you know, and um, yeah, and, and it's kind of a weirdly skewed type of thing. Um, so, um, so yeah, in terms of the artistic um, sort of side of it, um, I tend to work with people, um, both both um, Max Douglas or his, his, his uh, pseudonym, Sal Good Sam, of uh, uh, first novel and, and, uh, and Shannon Gerard in the second, were both friends. Um, they both like my writing um, and I really like their art. So, you know, starting at that in that space is really important, I feel like, because you, you're you're not trying to get somebody to do the style you want, or you know, if you, if you like their style, then 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 great, they're going to continue to do their style, and vice versa, right? So if they like your work and it and it jives with their aesthetic, then it's a lot easier for them to to spend a lot of time with it. Again, you're mm -hmm. realizing somebody else's narrative. You have to like it. You have to really like it, realistically. So yeah, yeah. You know, so um. In both those cases, no, actually, not in both those cases, but like um, uh, in in Max's case, I was able to get like a Canada Council grant for it. Um, so I was able to pay him for the, you know, for the work up front. So he got the majority of the of the of the, of the grant, um, which is only fair. Um, and um, yeah, and when it comes to like, um, yeah, the the. I think they're very they're very different. Like the, the types of styles are very different, but I really like them both mm -hmm. in different ways. Yeah. So I felt very lucky to get to work with them. But uh, but yeah, um, yeah. Were there were there ways, and I don't know if you can come up with specific examples of this, but maybe <laughs> where they they took what you had written and took it in directions that you just had not seen coming at all and surprised you with it? Yeah, there's lots of circumstances where there's like happy surprises, and then some mm. things were like kind of like. Usually, the only time I get um, fussy about uh, like, you know, or or give like a feedback has to do with like um, if something isn't coming across. Like, it's not like, oh, I don't like how you've drawn that person. I imagine they look different, or like, as far as I'm concerned, like just with the filmmaking is another thing. Like. Anytime I'm involved with a collaboration that involves more than more than me, then I expect things to change, and I don't have a, I'm not really wedded to a specific look or outcome. Um, you know, I already feel like I have a lot of input into it because of the story. But um, you know, and and truthfully, if if like I also write prose novels, so if I'm very if I feel like the story has to be told in a very specific way, I can do that myself. So mm -hmm. when I choose to do it with other people, it's because I enjoy the creative sort of collaboration rather than mm -hmm. like, oh, and and it's, you know, it's gonna be my vision plus it's gonna be graphic novel or whatever, right? Like it, I expect it to be a mix of the two. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I put myself, I just realized that I'm... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, maybe I'll just do this. Uh, maybe we'll just like all be on the screen. Can I? Uh, it took me way too long because I w I'm used to because I'm used to like Zoom where it shows you your face, and I was like, yeah, it's showing me. Wait a minute, this is StreamYard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, guys. Can um, I just ask him a question? Yes, please. Yeah, I'm just curious. So it sounds like you get to choose the artists that you want to work with, which is really interesting um, because I know people who do picture books for children where they, they're working with the publisher and the publisher chooses the artists, right? Sometimes sometimes that's a really good match and other times they have like no, most of the time they, they sounds like they have no jurisdiction over the matching process, right? So does that work for you? Like how do you then take the combo deal to the publisher, I guess is the question. Yeah, well, uh, usually in in both those cases, the the, the work was completed. So it's mm -hmm. like here's here's the book. Do you want it? Uh, and uh, and that can like for the first two books, that definitely worked out well. Um, 
I was publishing it in Canada and I got a, um, a publishing deal with um, IDW um, who published it elsewhere. So um, IDW is like, I don't know if they're the third or fourth biggest company, but it's a quite a large um, like graphic novel and comic. Yeah, they're up there. Yeah. So, um, but anyway, um, but, you know, so complete control, um, but also a big risk in terms of like, hey, maybe they won't want it. It's very possible once they see the final thing, they were like, well, it's not for our market or whatever, can't sell it. Uh, and actually that's the situation I'm in now with a current, a current collaboration I've, I've finished with um, Eric Kim. Um, and we, it's a sort of a sci-fi rom, rom-com, uh, very, it's quite different tonally from, from uh, the, the post-Rapture stuff. Um, and um, yeah, and so basically we've, we've, um, we've completed the book, um, but you know, now we're shopping it around to publishers and we haven't gotten a bite yet. And a lot of it has to do with just the, the pandemic and the weird place that publishing is in right now. But um, yeah, it's always a risk. Like once you make, make a thing, um, you know, like, in, and usually it is the case, like with nonfiction, you can kind of get away with an outline. Um, or if you're like a very established kind of fiction writer, you can kind of, um, you know, might get an advance or a multi-book deal or whatever. Um, but for the most part with fiction, they want to see the whole thing because they have so much to choose from. They're like, yeah. well, I'm not going to go on a sample chapter. Like you have to show me the whole thing. I have like a thousand people ready to show me their whole manuscript right so um yeah so we have uh pandemic cat who i think is rebecca i'm not i'm not sure uh very interested in this the cat in the midst of a pandemic there you <laughs> go. that's what this uh, call is missing by the way nadia don't you have a cat don't sorry? you have a cat i don't no i'm allergic to cats i love them but i am allergic to them it is yes <laughs> oh, <laughs> she confirms okay. that it's rebecca um i'm yeah, waiting for I mean, a cat butt to appear on screen somewhere <laughs> And your practice now. Sadly, yeah, I don't think any of us have pets. I think this is an unusual, an unusually yeah. petless, petless room. Um, yeah, I was thinking when you were talking, Jim, that the amount of, with the amount of um, collaboration that you do, you really like, you have to be interested in actually like finding out, being surprised by what other people bring to the process. You can't be a control freak. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I, I love it. I love collaboration. Like I love working with people. Um, you know, it's, it's always a challenge to like, you know, like even like, uh, yeah, figuring out kind of like where people are at, what people are hoping to get out of something, you know, like, especially with the longer term projects like graphic novels and movies, like, I mean, yeah, the, my, my collaborators on that, like we, we've been in it for a few years now, you know, and it mm -hmm. has, hasn't come out so it's like uh you know it's it's uh i mean the good thing is like as much as possible i try to structure it in a way that like um where i like hanging out with the people on a basic level of like hey these are these are like peter and and ashley for instance are my friends and over the last year during the pandemic where we've been sort of checking in every week and kind of like moving things along and applying to this and that and like trying to figure out various things it's like we've made progress, but it's, it's also being kind of like just fun to kind of hang out with them a little mm -hmm. bit, have a project to work on together and, um, you know, not be super stressed about it, but it's, you know, so I think that's the thing, like, uh, and a lot of people will be like, oh yeah, like so-and-so is your friend and you're doing this thing. And, and it feels like for other people, it can feel like, oh, you're on the, you can be on the outside of that, or you can feel like, oh, like, but truthfully, like it lowers the risk of like, if you know at a basic level that you're gonna have fun hanging out with this person regardless mm -hmm. of what the outcome is, then it's a win from the beginning. Like as opposed to like, regardless, like if if it if it's like a painful process, or even at the end, say for instance, doesn't doesn't sort of like, you know, doesn't light up the world or burn the internet down with its amazingness or like the response is like lackluster or whatever. Like that could be really disappointing, especially if it's like someone's first project that they worked on. Mm -hmm. and they thought, oh, this person's well known or whatever. That might be, you know, this is a good way. So they make a lot of sacrifices or or like that that type of thing. It can it can be kind of like um, again, the sort of managing expectations is like hard. Mm -hmm. um, 
um, you know, so so for me, it's one of the reasons I like to work with people I I know and like, and you know, it can. I want to just pick up on that because it reminds me of uh, something Sharoni was saying earlier about the pro your process, Sharoni, with the um, with the tongues <laughs> and with this program that you're in being one of like just kind of getting in there and not knowing where it's going and you just kind of like play around with the materials or the ideas and then Jim is saying you know in a very serious way you just kind of sit down with this group of people you don't necessarily know what's going to come out of it but you just kind of start like bouncing ideas off each other and experimenting they're both very like open ended experimental processes. To... Yeah, I mean, I don't know about you, Jim, but for me, I think that's key. Like, I, I, I'm always, you know, I'm, I, I have a lot of ideas, and sometimes I have an idea of what something should look like in its end product. But I'm so much more interested in the process. I think at this stage of my life, that I'm just really open to, you know, starting to play around, starting to do something. Like, I have um, this thing here, for example, that I was showing somebody the other day. It's just a little broken vessel that I made. Um, and it was actually something that I was using as a teaching tool. I was showing some students how to make a simple thing. Hold it up more to the camera so we can see sure. it a little more. Yeah. <laughs> so I was, initially I was just working on the base and, and making a simple pinch pot where you stick your thumb in a ball of clay and then start pinching it around into a shape. And then I started to use it to show them, um, you might want, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't, I can't figure out if there's a way for it to just like, start by showing the person that I wanted to show, but I have not figured, if there is, I haven't figured it out yet. No but anyway, go on, sorry. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I was gonna say that um, I, I used it to show pinch pot and then I was showing them how to build up from a pinch pot and change the shape and expand upon it using coiling, which is like sort of building snakes of clay and joining them together to build up a shape. Um, and I got really into it, but I also was dealing with a fibro flare around the time that I was making this. So I didn't get back into the studio fast enough to work on it. So when I came back to work on it, it had dried a little too much and I kind of forced it. And by forcing it and adding some water to it, it started to crack in all these places. So I started to play up the cracks and actually it generated a whole new set of a whole new series for me. I, I don't know if you can see far in the background um, on the very top of my um, hatch thing. There are a few tiny other little versions of this, but this idea was to start to like, you know, a lot of the time we think about vessels as containers and um, therefore they shouldn't be permeable or porous or broken, right? If they're mm -hmm. meant to contain liquid or, or grain or something like that, right? But in this case, I was really interested in this as a metaphor for my fibro flare and to try to think about like, why do I have to reject the whole just because sometimes it's cracking a little. And um, and so I started to play around with how to use the cracks as a structural and decorative feature. And then I started to just do taped lines. I used um, artist tape on this and then painted around the rest of it. So when I peeled the tape back, the white remained. And this is kind of inspired by fascia tissue. So I was thinking a lot about fascia mm. tissue because that seems to be one of the, one of the systems of my body that doesn't like me. Um, <laughs> most days, if, if I understand medicine at all, um, which I may not, I don't know. But <laughs> anyway, so from that, like, I found that I got really into this idea of, um, like, the, the clay showed me what it wanted to be, and then presented an opportunity for a metaphor. And then from there, I could evolve it into a deliberate series. So I think there's something in that dialogue between me and the materials that I don't, I didn't sit down to make a broken cracked vessel. But in doing it, I realized that I actually love the look of it. And then I started poking these holes around it because I thought if I could figure out how to do it, maybe I could stitch like um, sutures or something, some yeah. kind of embroidery or something like that, like in, you know, where the holes are around the cracks. And so I'm playing around with different options. And, and that's all in the process of material exploration, I find, right? Just like sort of surrendering your surrendering yourself, surrendering yourself to the dialogue with the material and not not forcing an expected outcome from the start. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very cool. It's also that I, I feel like with, with all with all three of you, you work in a lot of different media and you're also sort of not like if you if you have to follow an idea into like a different form <laughs> as, as opposed to, you know, it's, it's not just like following the idea. You might like like actually wander out of ceramics and into, you know, something more uh, two dimensional or uh, in Jim's case, you know, you might be working in film or you might be working in, in graphic novels or, um, and I think I, I, uh, Jared also has, I'm going to, Jared, I'm going to embarrass you again. Well, it's not that embarrassing. <laughs> Jared, uh, you might not know is, uh, your go-to guy for biblically accurate angel content on Twitter. 
And I, I found one of your one of your OP tweets, which is the <laughs> What is this? I love it. <laughs> that's one of one of that's a, a tweet Jared did that went viral. <laughs> I kinda love it too. <laughs> I don't understand it though. <laughs> Jared, do you want to explain yourself? <laughs> I just gotta chuck that in there because it seemed it seems thematically resonant because we've had uh, the, like post rapture apocalyptic stories and we've had uh, devotional or, or you know um, <laughs> uh, devotional objects and and biblically, biblically accurate angels seem to just kind of like fit in there somewhere <laughs> and also Twitter is like yet another medium I don't know. <laughs> Do you want to, this is too open-ended a question, but do you want to jump in and say something about that? And about your, your lasagna? <laughs> I think you muted yourself. Did he? Are you muted? No, we no, can't you're hear not. you. Say something. I'm giving up on He's not saying anything. Jared, yeah. say something. <laughs> or are you frozen? Oh, it's doing a thing. I think your your Wi-Fi might be funky because you were having trouble with Twitter earlier. Sorry, of course this happens when I ask you a question. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to like log off and log back on? Yeah, we can't hear you, sadly, tragically. <laughs> Your face is very expressive, so that's good. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so our, the, lasagna has, the lasagna has left the room. <laughs> the lasagna has <laughs> left the room <laughs> temporarily. Um, but I sort of, yeah, I can, I can kind of like bring that, bring that larger, uh, hold on, we've got a private check. But do you do you know something more about his his commitment to his <laughs> biblically accurate angel? Well, <laughs> while he's gone, I can I can explain. Uh, Jared, try saying something. Oh, really? crap. Uh. <laughs> hmm. Welcome to life in twenty twenty one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what about now? Oh yeah. yeah. Well, so I, I just switched from my headphones to the actual computer mic. Yeah, you're still you're cutting in and out a little, but it's better. I'm gonna try to you. Ugh. But we can hear you now. <laughs> oh, that's good. Um, <laughs> so you were going to explain better? the meter? Yes. It's better. Yeah, that's good. You're you are quite clear now. Okay. Um, biblically accurate angel. Right. Um, <laughs> at some point, the internet discovered the passages in like Isaiah and Ezekiel where, you know, they're having visions of seraphim and cherubim and all that. And they've got like four faces and they're covered with eyes or whatever. Mm -hmm. And there's the, um, you know, the wheels, the ophanim. Um, and uh, in Revelation, there's the four living creatures that are covered with eyes and all that. And at some point, the internet saw this and was like, oh, my God, this is hilarious or troubling or whatever. Um, or or both. Yeah. <laughs> and since I've, you know, I, I grew up in a, a rapture believing church, so mm -hmm. that's fun. Um, I have a, a long history with the sort of nightmarish biblical in, imagery, and it's just my hour has come <laughs> for the internet, apparently. <laughs> um, so I've been drawing a lot of things and just calling them angels, because why not? Um, it's basically it. It's it, For me, it's more soothing than anything else, because it's just drawing a lot of repetitive shapes and patterns and things like that. Um, and then making them horrific or, or whatever, or beautiful or both. Um, you were mostly in vector art, right? The I, <sighs> yes, because it's <laughs> faster for me. The first hmm. digital art that I ever learned to do was vector. Um, and then I've 
gradually branched out into like digital drawing. Um, but I also do a lot of watercolors and things like that, mostly when recording a podcast. <laughs> Nice. Um, I just learned about Ezekiel bread the other day. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, is, what is Ezekiel bread? I've heard of it, but I don't know what it is. It's... <laughs> what... <laughs> Maybe Jared can explain it better than I can. It's new information for me, but. <laughs> in... <laughs> wow, here's in Sunday school pays off in the weirdest place. <laughs> <laughs> um. In the book of Ezekiel, um, he God tells him to do the weirdest shit. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, in this case, um, he's supposed to... I might be combining stories here. I'm not sure. It's been a while. But um, he's supposed to lie on his side for some span of time. It's like 40 days, more than 40 days. It's some ridiculous span like of time. 390 days. Yeah. More than um, a year. It's a long time. Um, he has to lie there, um, and he can only eat this bread. And I forget the proportions, but it's specific ingredients. I have my laptop is wobbling because I'm gesturing. Um, and he has to cook it over a fire of human excrement. Um, oh, and then, okay, I did not. This is unfamiliar to me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the Bible is really interesting. Um, <laughs> and I don't know. I haven't paid much. This is, this is something you don't you, you don't need to do for the next uh, kitchen party. Because <laughs> I wasn't going to. Um, a, little bit, a little bit, a little bit beyond the. Yeah. You might, you might know, Sharon. You might know more about the actual like modern context, but I've heard like rumors where people are like making Ezekiel bread because if it's in the Bible in these proportions, then it must be healthy healthier for you than ordinary bread. I know there was a there was a book that came out like 15 years ago or something called I think the Maker's Diet where this guy only eats specifically things that are mentioned in the Bible and it like cured his Crohn's disease or something. Um, and it feels like an emanation of that. <laughs> <laughs> well the thing is Ezekiel is, is God always making him do these like like performance art parables. So the lying on your side and cooking the bread, or is that like Jerusalem is going to be uh, besieged for that long or something like that? So he's got, he's making starvation rations apparently to show the people of Jerusalem what they're going to deal with, and then they don't listen or they do repent or something. It's been again, it's been a long time. So I think that the the um, current <laughs> application of it, as I understood it the other day, I can Google it too. But um, the current application is it's one of the only places, or maybe the only place, where you get something akin to an actual recipe in the Bible. And so, <laughs> mm, yeah. So I think people got excited about the recipe aspect and thought, like you said, maybe it has some kind of healing properties or something. It requires a bunch of sprouted grains. So there are yeah. some companies or at least one company that's actually making a branded thing called Ezekiel bread now. But See, I this is the thing. I'd heard of that and I thought it was I thought it was just like uh, you know, dense bread with sprouted grains, the whole human excrement part of the story. Because I Well no, that's not I bet they don't do that. <laughs> one hopes they don't do that. <laughs> Like bring your own. You gotta bring your Soylent food. green yeah. is. You know. <laughs> Add your I mean, it's as coal. It's meant as coal. As yeah, yeah, fuel. yeah, yeah. yeah. But yes, still. and yet. <laughs> I gotta. This is. I oh. can't do a proper overlay, but that's one of your. Uh, yeah. That's another one. <laughs> oh wow. Oh yeah, these are super recent. Yeah, I just these grabbed a couple awesome. off of Twitter. Oh, if you like this, you would get <laughs> so into the demons in the Talmud. <laughs> I've, I've heard tell of a few of them, but I haven't read the Talmud. <laughs> oh, I will send you a sp special page about toilet demons. <laughs> <laughs> it's my favorite page of the Talmud at the moment. <laughs> oh my god! Once again, I think I think I think you need to explain about the toilet demons a little bit. I can't do it justice. I don't, I mean, like, I, you know, I'm sure there's a really reverential way to do it. And I, you know, I'm not going to take that take on it as much. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, there is a page of the Talmud where people were concerned about what would happen. Like it, the, the Talmud is a, a record of several centuries worth of conversations among rabbis. So people think that it's um, the book of oral law. That's how it's often translated. Mm -hmm the Jewish book of oral law, right? Um, but it's actually law plus a lot of parable and a lot of 
stuff that really reads a little bit as locker room banter, um, actually among a bunch of guys in a seminary. So it's a it's an interesting, complex, multifaceted document um, that that still functions as a kind of as the groundwork of rabbinic Judaism in the world today. And most Judaism derives from rabbinic Judaism with the exception possibly of the Karaites or one or two other groups, right? Um, so there's uh, there are a lot of demons in the Talmud as it happens because they were living, the, the people who wrote it were living in um, Babylon and they were kind of immersed in different cultural contexts like where there were demons, there were Zoroastrians beside them who were talking about different kinds of, astro of astrology and other things that influenced their thinking as well. So like you can see the, the relationship back and forth between some of these kinds of influences. Um, but there's, um, I think page 62A, let me just see if I got it. Um, yeah, like, you know, one of the things that happens in uh, this page of the Talmud is in one of the early books is that um, the rabbis, the, the student might follow the teacher into the bathroom to learn what is the proper behavior, what is the proper protocol when you go to the bathroom. Um, and then from there, they sort of describe this student and then this, this situation, and then they kind of move on to other stories. Um, I'll skip a couple. And <laughs> and then it gets interesting where um, there was, and I'm reading this out now, there was a particular bathroom in the city of Tiberias where when two would enter it, even during the day, they would be harmed by demons. I could offer possibly an interesting queer reading of that, I guess. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So not sure what's going on there, but um, but when they entered each alone, they were fine. They were not harmed, right? So it goes on like this, and then there's my. I think one of my favorite moments is that one of the t one of the rabbis, his mother raised a lamb to accompany him to the bathroom. Um, she should have raised a goat for him, says somebody else. But a goat could be interchanged with a goat demon. So that's the idea. Like if he takes this goat demon, this goat, sorry, to the bathroom and meets a demon, he can exchange it. And come out safe, right? So, like, the, it's like it seems to be like a literal, real concern for them. Um, but I don't have a good handle on it. There is a podcast about the Talmud demons. If you really want to know more about this, <laughs> oh, I super do. Yeah. <laughs> but my favorite one is the part where um, one of them, uh, <laughs> the his wife would. It says his wife would rattle a nut in a copper vessel for him to fend off demons when he was in the bathroom. And then there's another one who, um, oh no, it's the same one, sorry. When he became the head of the seminary, he required an additional degree of protection. So his wife constructed a window for him opposite where he would defecate and placed her hand upon his head. <laughs> I guess to ensure that he didn't get lifted off. <laughs> It's kind of it's it's fabulous. Like I don't know I don't know how to read this kind of material. Like I'm I'm just I'm I'm in classes where I'm actually learning the Talmud, uh -huh. and um, this is a page that we haven't discussed, and I don't know what to do with it because I came across this sort of on my own, and I'm like uh, context. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think pandemic cat had to leave, but she wants just wants us to know that the best lasagna your cooking show ever. <laughs> <laughs> Good. How often do you get lasagna cooking and, you know, Talmudic And toilet demons. <laughs> toilet, <laughs> toilet demons. <laughs> well, hopefully you don't need to deal with toilet demons after the lasagna. <laughs> Ideally, no. <laughs> uh, Sharoni, I'm just remembering that time that we went on. You and I went on a walk in the fall and we were walking through the annex and someone had put a, a bunch of books in a cardboard box on the sidewalk as they do and you found like a scholarly edition of Torah and yes. you were like should I take this and I was like yes <laughs> you know when a free copy of the Torah lands in your lap like that clearly <laughs> <laughs> this is meant to be oh yeah. my goodness no I don't I hope that this does not then mean that a whole bunch of people will start knocking on my door offering me copies of the Bible but <laughs> <laughs> that practice has probably largely dissipated during the pandemic Oh dear. <laughs> Jim, how are you faring with all this religious conversation? <laughs> yeah, I, I I find it interesting. It, I uh, I mean, yeah. I've I've read the book of Revelations quite quite thoroughly and um, yeah, I'm I'm I, I was always really interested in like 
the like to like in, in many many uh, sort of reads of of that particular book were like. Um, this is obviously like made to scare people because it, it's like <laughs> it's it's such a horror story and it's such a different tonal shift from the rest of the Bible uh, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. And it's sort of like it's also written 400 years after everything else when like like the original kind of like, um, uh, you know, the original kind of. I don't know the the church and the 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 momentum um people were straying a little bit and so it was sort of like hey uh if you uh keep straying you're gonna have a whole bunch of shit happen right now like i mean it's all like so it, it really does feel like um it's like a political move on the in in the in the with the church to kind of like um you know so so to me like like yeah like hearing about these uh these like various these various idiosyncrasies like i know that there's a story behind each one and probably a lot of them just have to do with political kind of maneuvering or like some kind of like socio-political reason rather than it you know um you know i don't know someone was selling toilets back then and they were like, <laughs> it was a tie-in <laughs> yeah you know like they wanted to you know add a little anti-demon bit that they could get more money for it or i don't know <laughs> value add. Jim, I was going to ask you, like, what was your, what drew you to um, writing two books about the post-rapture apocalyptic world where you, if you didn't have a, a religious, uh, religious upbringing? What was that? Oh, I, I did. I was, I, I, I was brought up Catholic. So okay. like, um, but it, but yeah, hearing about the, so I was touring um, with one of my books in the States around the time that um, Bush got in for a second term, I'm going to say 2004, something like that. I forget around that. Yeah. Um, yeah, the American remembers that it was, <laughs> it was a dark day. I mean, it's funny because it was a really dark day for my two American, uh, like people that I was touring with. Um, and, uh, I mean, it's funny just in retrospect, oh man, if they had only known how much worse it was going to get, like with Trump, I mean, Bush seems mm -hmm. like a fucking, uh, angel, Take but anyway, <laughs> Um, but the, uh, but yeah, at the time they were like really bummed about it. And so I was kind of like learning more about Bush and the fact that Bush actually had made statements about believing in the rapture or like at least kind of paying lip service to be belief in the rapture, whether he actually believed in it or didn't. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's just not something politically that is a force in, mm -hmm. in Canada in the same way. So mm -hmm. I became like really pretty fascinated by just that whole, yeah, just the whole mythos around it. And then just the interest in kind of playing around with that kind of, again, like kind of treating it like a, a fantasy, um, like the, just like if there's elves or vampires or, you know, people floating to the sky and angels. So what happens, you know, so <laughs> that was, that was my general uh, take on it. Like, I mean, I didn't, I mean, it's, it's semi parodic in terms of the tone. Um, but not really satiric. I don't know. It's a weird. It's a weird kind of book. I think because it's like I, I did kind of take it at face value. I tried to anyway, um, mm -hmm. as much as I could. Um, so hey, even I that if, taking it at face value is super complicated. How did you do that? Because like I know <laughs> I saw growing up so many charts and timelines and horrifying art where like Babylon is like a sexy woman on a beast and she's doing, you know, all that. Um, so even like rapture people don't agree on what like the literal is. Did you pick a specific uh, I school mean, of thought? No, I went, I just, I just, I just took most of my inspiration from the actual book of Revelation. So mm -hmm. like I, I pulled a lot and then, you know, then there's a lot of stuff like there's Jack Chick stuff and then, and like, <laughs> It's it's a it's a mix and it, and I'm not by any by any uh, stretch of the imagination a, a religious scholar so you know I went as deep as I felt like I needed to to mine what I wanted to to create a weird weird story so um, yeah I mean like uh, there's definitely been people who have um, uh, who have kind of like analyzed it and I mean to me a lot of it is just kind of uh, fairly uh, imaginative and not not really 
grounded in a whole lot of detail. I like there's no there's no footnotes. There's no you know what I mean. It's just it's I just use it as inspiration the same way that I I. I re I took about the same amount of respect that people would have if they decided to write a vampire story. Like they're, they're not going to go back and try to kind of like line up all the different versions of vampires. They're going to say, I think that kind of thing is sounds cool. I'm going to take that and then I'm going to meld it into this. And like the same kind of uh, fair, fairly laissez faire kind of um, perspective on it. Like, um, I'm sure for anybody who is an actual kind of like scholar or has thought about it a lot, it, it'd be like nails on chalkboard for them. Um, but for me, I was just like, eh, it seems like a fun world to play in or like to think about and um, take the piss out of to a certain extent. So that was, that was yeah. it is fundamentally kind of incoherent, like vampire yeah. lore. So <laughs> the only people who are, I think are going to find it grating are people who actually believe it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. There aren't a lot of like people with an, with uh, a purely scholarly uh, pedantic interest in the rapture <laughs> who are like, no, that wasn't. You know, there was, <laughs> there was. I, I don't even like know the details, but this detail is wrong, uh, and just be annoyed in it for annoyed, annoyed about mad about it from a completely like scholarly. That is wrong. That's not what it says. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, the, the people who do academic religious studies would find your work interesting, I'm sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, also, sorry. Yeah. I, I, I guess it, it, it sort of, yeah, it depends on their sense of humor about it or whatever, I guess. But uh, I think, um, yeah, I mean, by like for me, calling it post rapture was kind of like a distinct effort into framing it as like either a post like is, is treating the rapture like an apocalypse and and mm -hmm. like an apocalypse story um but in a but in a more kind of pop cultural way right so yeah um, well there's you brought up jack chick and that that was ma making me think that there is that uh yeah there's that sort of um <laughs> there's that history of evangelism in the graphic novel format as well that you're kind of you know if you're if you're doing a graphic novel about uh, about the rapture, you're kind of in dialogue with. So, Jared, did you did you have like crazy tracts in in graphic novel format when you were growing up? <laughs> really fast. This is not. I just bumped my elbow with a hearse. Um, <laughs> I happen oh. to have a Jack Chick style <laughs> tract. Oh, there it is. In the Dune universe. In the Dune universe. Awesome. So it's. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, you it's can really... like whip that out without actually getting up from your chair. His <laughs> it just tells us a lot. Oh, some of my comics are right here. You can't yeah. see them. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I mean the graphic novel has been such an interesting like contested space from its inception that you know it was sort of like it was it was like the scary, you know, like uh just a, the, like a, a vice filled format for a long time it was you know it was unserious it was something you couldn't possibly do serious artistic work in and it was also a propaganda tool and it was also so yeah yeah so jared is that i i was just gonna ask you was that um growing up uh in an evangelical context did that did, were there like graphic novel novels well, that, of, that were specifically <laughs> pentecostal which is yeah. a whole different animal from main, mainstream evangelicalism okay um <laughs> I know that there are some out there. The only one that I had growing up was a little comic adaptation of The Cross and the Switchblade, which is David Wilkerson's book that he wrote about converting a gang leader. Um, hmm. And it's it's a bizarre little thing because you can tell the person who drew it um, had no idea how homoerotic he was actually being. <laughs> so... <laughs> That's the whole thing. Does the beeping mean that the lasagna is done? Is it? It does in this context. Yes, it doesn't always mean that. <laughs> Sadly, it does not always signal delicious lasagna is here. But <laughs> to clarify, this is good that we get to. That is beautifully timed. We get to see the lasagna coming out of the oven, and it's like coming up to sit. Although I was gonna, I was I'm gonna ask them a for a minute. Thing. <laughs> okay. Jared, where where did you grow up? Were you always in Washington? Yeah, I mean, I was born in Reno, but moved here when I was a baby. So yeah, I didn't know you were born in Reno. <laughs> yeah, hmm. um, 
fun fact. <laughs> fun fact. <laughs> uh, yeah, grew up in the Seattle area. So. Cool. That's where I've been my whole life. <laughs> yeah. I was going to, because I promised to, and because it's interesting, ask Jim uh, about um, a couple other projects. I told you he had a lot of projects. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, the, uh, so so it, it quickly and in a nutshell, tell us about what, uh, well, tell us about what gain, gain is. Let's start there. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, so about uh, 10 years or so ago, I started um, something called the Hand-Eye Society, which is a video game arts organization. So... The idea is that it's not an industry commercial thing. It kind of looks at um, the the way that um, game creators are connected to other artists, um, and basically looks at game culture through uh, and game creation through like an an arts and culture lens. And mm. so I started that um, along with five five other folks, and um, and then about five years or so ago, I stepped away from it. Um, it's still a ongoing Toronto organization and it's a nonprofit um, here. Um, and uh, I started something called the Game Arts International Network, which was started to kind of interconnect groups like Hand Eye Society um, with other groups in, um, say, in Seattle. Uh, there's um, uh, there's a bunch of the different game organizations. There's something called the Portland Indie Game, um, I can't remember the name, it's like Pig something. Um, Oh, there we go. Um, so yeah. So so yeah. It's all over the world. Yeah, it's meant to kind of like interconnect these groups, and there's like probably fifty or sixty entities around the world. Some of them are like games festivals um, running on the same models, like like a, a, a film festival, and some of them are independent curators. Some of them are organizers looking to kind of like um, create opportunities for women to make games, in particular mm -hmm. because of the diversity issues in in a homogenous game culture is um yeah and just like just basically the layer of people that are trying to make uh things easier and better for game creators in their regions so so yeah so right now we're in the middle of running a symposium which is basically offering professional development opportunities for game curators and organizers and and that kind of stuff so um yeah it's a new kind of strata mm -hmm. of sort of arts uh you know arts organizing, I suppose, that's happening in the in the video game world that uh, I'm excited to be part of, so. Like I was just saying about um, graphic novels, I think video games also kind of had this not serious, how could that possibly be art, uh, you this, know? This is an ongoing, <laughs> this is an ongoing thread of my uh, personal fascination with art. It's almost always related to its cultural standing. So like mm. science fiction, video games, comic books, those are all kind of cultural gutter type of things that like um, I really enjoy working in because I like uh, I, I like kind of the energy of it. Uh, I like the kind of unpretentiousness of it, but I also like kind of, you know, when people will say, I don't really like science fiction, but I like your books. I'm like, well, then you like science fiction. You just hadn't found the books you liked yet. You're wrong. So I sort of like being able to kind of show people how they're wrong and also, open them up to a kind of whole different world that they previously might have kind of like pooed or said that's not for me and you know and then and then they come across like some weird video game that was like uh blow their minds and like sort of like opens a whole new world to them so that's that's also a really awesome privilege to get to do that so uh i so yeah usually we have to there is actual lasagna There's okay. oh there we are <laughs> Look at that melty cheese. Yeah. <laughs> Look at that. Yes. Springy. That was a little, I don't know. I didn't mean to do that. No, it was good though. <laughs> a little bit of cheese porn. Thank oh you. my God. Yeah. Oh, there it goes. Look at, this. It Look at it. <laughs> it's now volcanically hot and you will like burn your face forever if you try and eat it. Oh yeah. No, for sure. <laughs> But yes, show us, show us. We can pretend we can smell it. Oh my it's god! Little, yeah. It's very. It always ends up very, very soft. Ooh. It yes. doesn't stack the way you might expect. But I don't care. <laughs> I want to eat looks, it. It looks <laughs> delicious. I don't know. <laughs> I want to eat it, but your your chances of eating it are, are much higher. <laughs> well, while oh I'm god. waiting, 
I know Mikey was wondering about whether it would be tall yes. lasagna or what. It's just tall lasagna when you stack it. <laughs> yeah, so, that was the, the, yeah, the question was if you stack- Science completed. If you, if you have two lasagnas and you put one lasagna on top of the other lasagna, are they still two lasagnas? Or are they now one very tall lasagna? This is it's not just, even science, yeah. it's philosophy, I think. This is philosophical. It's just a tall lasagna. lasagna identity. It's a tall lasagna. Yeah. <laughs> it's a mutant lasagna. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> oh. All right. Well, that's. We are coming up on six six o'clock. See, I, I told you we would like <laughs> not even close to run out of things to talk about. <laughs> and Jared timed it perfectly and is now eating lasagna and making the rest of us jealous. Like right at six. It's really hot. This was a mistake. <laughs> 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 oh, Jared is, is now a cheese goblin with the. Oh, yeah. oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! So Jared, I made the lasagna along with you, vegetarian, not vegan. The van the vanilla with makes the meat sauce taste gamey. <laughs> hmm. I'm confused about the vegetarian meat sauce. <laughs> yeah, same. <laughs> if you're if you're still here, Rebecca, explain. <laughs> If you are indeed Rebecca. <laughs> oh, she confirmed I asked. Yeah. Oh, okay. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, but that's fun. This is this is the second time that someone has cooked along with you. Although when, when Megan was on, she she actually made the, the manti dumplings on yeah. screen at the same time. So this is this is very exciting when you get like I wonder <laughs> the gaminess might have to do with different vanillas mm. because there's so many different kinds, and unless you've got the exact same Okay, she says ground round, but uh, vegetarian. But that's still not vegetarian, Rebecca. <laughs> this is why we're confused. <laughs> <by it. laughs> you said vegetarian. Is that? I, 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 I think you're the Eve's ground round, which is like a kind it of. It could be, yeah. The veggie, this this soy based ground round. The texturized vegetable protein ground round. Okay. <laughs> I feel like we have to wait for her to explain that, but <laughs> this is also a pork sausage rather than right beef or chicken or whatever else. A so. sage-based pork sausage. Yes. That's very yes. nice. That might make a big difference with the vanilla. <laughs> okay. But, my, but I've done it with other stuff too, with with a meatless. Oh yes, there we go. A meatless okay. sauce and added vanilla, and it Eve. doesn't affect it that much. I kind of intrigued by the. Vanilla. I kind of intrigued by the idea of of uh, making the texturized vegetable protein meat sauce taste gamey. It's like vegetarian game. I don't know. It's kind of <laughs> it's, yeah. yeah, like adding that nutritional yeast to stuff, which so tastes like cheese. Hmm. Yeah, recreating recreating the experience of venison <laughs> with Eve's, <laughs> or like goat curry. Fascinating. Okay. Um, wow. So yeah, it's six o'clock. Jared is eating lasagna. I think it's time for us to wrap up. Oh, just a, a note to the guests. I'm going to like, I'm going to end the broadcast, but you guys can stay on and we can debrief if you like, but it is time to say goodbye to the three people who are still watching us. And you know, the people who in the future might watch this, this uh, live stream uh, archived on Twitch or on YouTube. Thank you guys, in in incidentally, for the, the invisible cast members uh, on the on the chat and, and watching us for sticking around. It's mm. great to have you. And uh, thanks to all three of you, Jared, for cooking a lasagna and now eating it in front of us. <laughs> <laughs> it's dinner time here. Yeah. It's, it's lunchtime. It's, uh, you know. There you go. Uh, Jim and Sharoni, this is such an interesting conversation. Um, Rebecca says thanks as well. Thank you. Uh, Thanks to everybody. Yeah, Thank a pleasure know. to meet you guys again. I know. I think I met you last year, sometime when the pandemic started. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then Chris says thanks. That was nice. All right. Well, we will see you next <laughs> month when when yay. we will see you next month when who knows what Jared will cook. If anyone has suggestions, you know, <laughs> I can pass them along. <laughs> uh, nothing involving human feces or you know human <laughs> sacrifice or. <laughs> Angel. Let's try. Let's try and keep it legal. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs>